I'm at uh, Forum Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education. I always like to say that by both uh, training and vocation, I'm a religious educator. So I'm an educator at heart, and actually I've been an educator for all of my adult life. My first teaching job was as a preschool teacher. And so I've taught at, I have literally taught at every level from preschool through uh, graduate higher education. But I said that that's my uh, vocation by training. My primary vocation is as a husband and a father. My wife, Barbara Jean, and I have been married for almost 30 years. Uh, we have 23-year-old twin sons, and our youngest is my darling daughter, Rose, who's 15, uh, my only daughter. Uh, spoiled rotten, of course, but what can I say? And my wife teaches, uh, she has a degree in biblical studies and teaches adult education and undergraduate college level courses in Bible. So that's a little bit about myself. Our topic for today is Roman Catholic Church teaching on homosexuality. And I want to begin with just a brief uh, reflection, only just a minute. We won't discuss it since we're, we don't have the time, but I'd like to begin to think, of, to invite you to think, what comes to mind when you think about, on the one hand, homosexuality, and on the other hand, the Catholic Church? What comes to mind when you think about homosexuality together with the Roman Catholic Church. Just take a moment for reflection. One of the things that I've found over the course of the past 30 years is that too often um, Roman Catholic Church teaching on homosexuality is not understood or not understood fully. Too often people are quick to agree with what they think church teaching is or to take issue and disagree with church teaching without fully understanding it. So the, the largest part of the presentation today will be just what does the church teach about homosexuality? Uh, that's really the, the first part. Then what are the underlying convictions, uh, the, the inner logic we could talk about under, that, that underlies that teaching? And then what, are, what would we see as the major strengths as well as areas where we could critique it? And in looking at areas where we could critique Catholic church teaching on homosexuality, I'll focus on those areas that really that I think under those critiques of the teaching that understand and build upon what I see as the underlying convictions in inner logic. So that's the plan for the time we have together. I start with a preliminary comment. And the preliminary comment is that anytime you raise questions about sexuality in the church, the, the underlying um, premise you have to begin with is that from the standpoint of the Catholic Church, all issues of human sexuality are at heart educational issues. That if we look at, if we go back to the Second Vatican Council, the pattern at the Second Vatican Council was to mention uh, most of the issues or all of the issues uh, sometimes briefly in one of the two pastoral constitutions on the church, and then to further explore those issues in another document. So the pastoral constitution on the church, Gaudium et Spes, mentions the issue of sexuality, and then that issue is taken up again in the Declaration on Christian Education. And in fact, it's taken up at the very beginning of the Declaration on Christian Education. And the clear signal that's sent is that any time we raise issues about sexuality, and this would include homosexuality, our underlying concern has to be with persons as sexual beings. And our underlying has to be, concern has to be with the nurturing the full development of persons as sexual beings and nurturing a sense of sexuality that's integrated with other aspects of human personality. And this 
Um, one of the things that Vatican II didn't do is it didn't address some, it didn't address specific questions about um, sexual ethics. And this was pointed out after the council. And so the, the, the primary document issued in the wake of the council on sexuality was the uh, declaration on certain questions concerning sexual ethics. But what interesting thing about that document is it treats those issues as educational issues. And it, and it underscores the importance of sexuality education. Then in Familiaris Consortium on the Family by John Paul II from 1981, uh, he also talks about the importance of sexuality as an educational issue and the importance of beginning sexuality education in the home. Then if we look at the, uh, also in the past 40 years, there were four major documents on human sexuality, three of them issued by the U.S. Catholic bishops, one of them issued by the Vatican, the Vatican Council on the Family. And what's interesting about all of them is that they have an educational focus. So it's oftentimes we raise the issue of homosexuality and think, oh, this is a moral issue. First and foremost, like all, like all issues of sexuality, it's an educational issue. And, and what the church teaches is that anytime we raise issues about sexuality, including homosexuality, our underlying concern has to be with persons and nurturing the full development of persons uh, in all aspects of human personality, including sexuality. And to relate all aspects of, of human personality to faith. That's sort of the underlying underlying premise of all church teaching on sexuality, including homosexuality. Now, what if we turn specifically to church teaching on, on uh, homosexuality? Uh, here we have the church discusses three things. It discusses a homosexual orientation, what we could call homosexual behaviors, and this would include homogenital acts and homosexual lifestyles, and then homosexual relationships. And Essentially, what we could say the church teaches, and this is putting it simplistic, simply, but hopefully not too simplistically, is the church teaches in terms of um, homosexual orientation, yes, this is something that we should affirm. The church wants to affirm. Uh, affirming, the church says that we should embrace people with a homosexual orientation and affirm their identity as sexual beings. But then when it comes to homosexual behaviors, the basic church teaching is no, that homosexual behaviors are seen as against the natural order of life and are thus seen as morally illicit. And then there's a really interesting twist when it comes to talking about homosexual relationships. Most of church teaching is no to gay, like no to gay marriage, no to same-sex unions, but there's a little bit of a pastoral twist there where the church says homosexual relationships, okay, perhaps, maybe, but let's talk. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But let's go back to begin with uh, homosexual orientation, the yes part. And I will be drawing most of my remarks today from uh, three documents. There's the 1997 Always Our Children from U.S. Catholic bishops, the 2006 Ministry to Persons with um, a homosexual inclination, also from the U.S. Catholic bishops and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Other documents, including the ones I've already mentioned or shown, um, cover some of the same issues, but um, basically the, uh, the core teachings are repeated in those three documents. So if you're interested in the issue, those would be three documents that would give you the teaching. And if we look at always our children, and I think they present the, the core church teaching on, homosexual, on a homosexual orientation very well. What's recognized there, also recognized in the catechism, is that the church, the, the church acknowledges that a homosexual orientation is experienced as a given, not something freely chosen. Um, it even goes so far in some of the statements to say that we can talk about it as part of who a person is as made by God. So homosexual persons are persons um, with integrity made by God and that part of that inner integrity of who they are is to be homosexual persons. 
And the basic message of the church to homosexual persons is, we welcome you as our children. We acknowledge you as children of God, and we acknowledge you as children of the church, and we welcome you. That's the basic church teaching on, on a homosexual orientation. Now, there's a couple of, of uh, corollaries to that. And I think this corollary is stated perhaps best in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the quote I have up here. The number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. This inclination, which is objectively disordered, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit, constitutes for most of them a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives, and if they are Christians, to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross the difficulties they may encounter from their condition. The senses I want to highlight now are they must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. Essentially, what the church teaches is that we should welcome homosexual persons into our faith communities, into our schools, into other institutions. We should be advocates for their fair treatment as persons. That we should help to secure for them pastoral care and pastoral counseling as needed. And then in the document, Ministry to Persons with a Homosexual Orientation, it goes beyond this and it goes further and says that actually the church should be involved in outreach and even evangelization to persons who have a homosexual orientation. And the church's parish social justice ministries should be, direct, should be directed to include advocacy for homosexual persons when, when there's clear discrimination against them in the society in which that community exists. That's core church teaching on, on how we should welcome approach persons with a homosexual orientation. Now, let's turn to the, the next piece, homosexual behaviors. The church teaches that um, whenever we talk about homosexual behavior, our, the place to begin, or the, the, anytime we talk about sexual behavior, uh, genital sexual uh, intimacy, the place to begin is with marriage. And core church teaching is that uh, general sexuality should be expressed within conjugal married love, and that married love should ideally be both procreative and unitive. Two purposes of marriage, Catholic Church teaching, it's procreative, it's unitive. By procreative, that basically at the biological level, a man and woman have uh, the potential to procreate, or at least could be a sign of the procreative potential of male and female bonding. So that's the core, so that, so that, that uh, marriage, the, the appropriate expression for uh, sexual behaviors in marriage, the purpose of marriage first is procreation, second is unitive. If we think of, of the procreation, the, the procreative purpose of marriage at the biological level, the unitive level is at the existential and the social level. That w the way to think about this in terms of church teaching is that um, men and the male and the female fit together like puzzles, like puzzle pieces to form a unity. And, and it's, it's at, the, at, at the deep existential level, there's a, a maleness and female come together, and that foundation then is the foundation of the family, and the family is the foundation of society. So that's core, so, so we talk about sexual behavior, the appropriate uh, venues to talk about it within marriage, to talk about it being procreative and unitive. The difficulty with homosexual uh, sexual activity is that it can't be procreative. Also, the church holds that it can't also be unitive. That um, two men or two women do not go together in the same way that the male and the female do. So the church's teaching then is that homosexual behavior is disordered or naturally disordered, or it uses the terms objectively disordered or intrinsically 
disordered. Objectively, we say, what, is the, what are the objective purposes of human sexual behavior? That homosexual behavior can't fit those purposes, so it's disordered. That's the language that's used in the teaching. Now, there are some corollaries to this teaching as well. That the, the church has a particular concern with the destructive potential of what it talks about as homosexual subcultures. Essentially, the way to think about this is the church has a concern with promiscuous sexual activity, uh, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. And church teaches that, that promiscuous sexual activity, treating sex as a recreational activity, trivializes it and fails to respect the deep significance of sexuality for human personhood. So whether, whether, uh, uh, whether uh, promiscuous sexuality is, is, exp is in a, a heterosexual or homosexual uh, environment, it's problematic and should be prohibited. And church teaches that within so-called uh, homosexual subcultures or gay subcultures that actively promote promiscuous uh, recreational sexual activity among homosexuals, that that's especially morally problematic. A second corollary to that is that the church stands in opposition to all groups that lobby for sexual lifestyles, all groups that lobby, that could be seen as lobbying for the trivialization of sex, all groups that, see, that are seen as not respecting the sacredness of marriage. And if, actually, if you want to see some good examples, and we don't have time to win this today, but if you want to see examples of, of church teaching put into practice today, listen to what our current pope says about human sexuality and about homosexuality in particular. He's very good at, at always bringing the issue back to respect for persons, nurturing the full human development of persons, including homosexual persons, but then on the other hand, expressing that church prohibition uh, against homosexual behaviors. Now, I want to make an important distinction here because I think sometimes this gets lost. The church says that we should be advocates for homosexual persons, that our, our faith communities, our institutions, but uh, on the other hand, we should oppose groups that lobby for sexual, homosexual lifestyles. Now that could have very practical implications for you as a Catholic institution. It could be argued that if you don't have uh, an advocacy group for homosexual persons, you could and um, uh, probably should insofar as there, are, there continues to be discrimination against homosexual persons in society that we should be advocates for homosexual persons as persons and advocates for their full human development in accord with church teaching on sexuality. But if we do that as, as church institutions, we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of becoming advocates for lifestyles based on behaviors that are not procreative and unitive. So this is, this is an important distinction for Catholic institutions. A while back, I, I was called in to consult for a group at Boston College, the School of Theology and Ministry. They started uh, a, gray, a, a gay straight alliance group, and it ha was actually doing some very good advocacy work for some of their students. The leader of that group gave um, an interview to a local newspaper, and when she went beyond advocacy for the rights of homosexual persons and spoke about advocacy for homosexual lifestyles. Uh, the bishop in Boston saw the interview, was very upset, called the president of Boston College, the president called the dean, and the group was disbanded. So it's an important distinction to sort of keep in mind of what, where the church says we can operate and where it says we can't. Now what about homosexual relationships? what you would expect in some ways. The church opposes gay marriage, it opposes gay civil unions, it opposes the adoption of children by gay couples, it, um, it speaks out, it opposes the publicly pro proclaimed gay relationships, it, pro it opposes lobbying for homosexual lifestyles. 
The church also prohibits roles of service within the church for those engaged in public homosexual behaviors. But in all of that, the church still says that it wants to be welcoming to homosexuals as persons. These are the two sides of the, the uh, church teaching that in some ways don't easily come together, but yet the church tries to hold them together. And that's that always being welcoming to homosexual persons, but on the other hand, opposed to anything that, that uh, speaks of homosexual behavior and homosexual lifestyles as something that is not in accord with the unitive and procreative purposes of marriage. But now there's, to, there's an interesting, um, there's, there, there is an interesting way, though, in which the church does say yes in some instances to homosexual relationships. And that would be in some instances of marriage. And here's the passage, uh, one of the passages that, that presents that, and this is from the Ministry to Persons with a Homosexual Inclination document, and it's in issues of baptism. It says, baptism of children in the case of same-sex parents presents a serious pastoral concern. Nevertheless, the church does not refuse the sacrament of baptism to these children, but there must be well-founded hope that the children will be brought up in the Catholic religion. Now, you could ask, what are the implications of this? Well, one other way to think about the implications of this is to turn to the Catechism of the Catholic Church and look at the statement on the parents' responsibilities of baptism. And that's the statement I have here. What the church says, the grace of, for the grace of baptism to unfold, the parents' help is important. So, so too is the role of the godfather and godmother who must be firm believers, able and ready to help the newly baptized child or adult on the road of Christian life. Their task is, truly, is a truly ecclesial function the whole ecclesial community bears some responsibility for the development and safeguarding of the grace of baptism. Three points to highlight here. Parents and godparents who bring their children for baptism have to show that they're what, what, what the church says, firm believers. And there's a recognition on the part of the church that some same-sex couples pass the test of being true believers, firm believers in faith. So it's a pastoral responsibility of pastoral caregivers to interview. It's not just an automatic, no, you, if you're a homosexual couple, you can't bring your child for baptism. It, the, the, it's the responsibility of the pastoral caregivers to interview the same-sex couple and to determine whether or not they're firm believers in faith. And if they are, to welcome them and their children to baptism. And, and what are the implications of that? It means that you recognize that there can be same-sex couples who take on an ecclesial function in the church for the education and faith of their children. And that this is a function that is to be exercised in collaboration with the whole faith community. That's a pretty extraordinary thing to, for the church to say in some ways, isn't it? Now, a final point before we move on. And the church recognizes that, that on the one hand, church teaching itself about homosexuality is complex. It also recognizes that there are negative influences in society that make issues about homosexuality even more complex. And that overall, issues about homosexuality can be confusing and are issues that need to be discussed to be understood. So there's also a recognition in the church that there's a need for ongoing development, ongoing conversation and development about church teaching on homosexuality. And here's a statement of that as presented in Ministry to Persons with a Homosexual Orientation says the pervasive influence of contemporary culture creates at times significant difficulties to the reception of Catholic teaching on homosexuality. In this context, there's a need for a special effort to help persons with a homosexual inclination understand church teaching. At the same time, it is important that church ministers listen to the experiences, needs, and hopes of the persons with a homosexual inclination to whom and with whom they minister. 
The statement goes on to say, dialogue provides an exchange of information and also communicates a respect for the innate dignity of other persons and a respect for their consciences. Such dialogue facilitates an ongoing interior conversion for all persons truly engaged in exchange. This is a very carefully crafted statement. And it's, it's worth it to unpack it just a little bit. The first thing that that statement brings up, if we go back, can we go back to the slide before this? Pervasive influence of contemporary culture. Throughout the, the church teachings on homosexuality, it talks about um, the, the cultural obstacles to really, that, that prevent us from having a clear understanding and a, and a nuanced approach to homosexuality. And the first of these is what it talks about is destructive moral relativism. Second is hedonism. Or in the Declaration on Certain Questions Concerning Te Sexual Ethics, it talks about it as, uh, rather than hedonism, as an unbridled exaltation of sex. That too often, it says, our, our, our discussions of sexuality, and, and, and particularly of homosexuality, are impoverished because essentially we've turned, in our culture, there's a tendency to trivialize sex um, and to really um, uh, not recognize its deeper significance for human personhood. The second thing it says that, so anytime we have discussions about sexuality, we need to recognize these cultural obstacles. The second thing it says that in any discussions about homosexuality, it's important that church teaching be presented accurately. Go forward. Next. So the first is awareness of cultural obstacles. Second is an accurate presentation of church teaching. That's what I've tried to give you now. So essentially, I've tried to give you, outline the church teaching, so that if you wanted to follow up on this, that you, you've met the criteria the church has set for dialogue about issues of homosexuality. Awareness of the cultural obstacles, a clear and accurate presentation of church teaching. And then the third piece of this, and this is to me in some ways the most interesting, where the statement that, could you go back one? Um, it says, such dialogue facilitates an ongoing inter interior conversion for all persons truly engaged in the exchange. The key here is for all persons. The church doesn't say what, it, what the church said in the past but no longer says, through authentic dialogue, homosexual persons will be converted. Now the church says now, through authentic dialogue, all persons, all the church, will change. So the church has recognized the need. It says, yes, there are lots of issues and questions that could be raised about church teachings of about homosexuality. Let's have that dialogue. Let's have it in the appropriate way. And know up front that everybody involved is going to change as a result of that. Now, we could, we could add to this one other final point. The church says that the appropriate place for that dialogue on a broader level is in an educational context. That, remember I said at the beginning, that sexuality is an educational issue. So the appropriate context for continuing discussions about homosexuality is educational context. So it would be context like this, and context that your school could provide, rather than pastoral context where it might be more inclined to foster confusion. But in terms of understanding and then taking that dialogue that could lead all of us to conversion, educational context are the place to have it. Now we could take this just a step further if we look at what I call the interior logic and foundational convictions of church teaching on homosexuality. And we start with the church teaching on homosexual persons and the underlying conviction on church teaching on homosexual persons is that in all we do as church, we should show respect for the dignity, for human dignity, and the dignity of all persons. So this clear statement of this is in Ministry to Persons with a Homosexual Orientation from the U.S. Catholic Bishops, where they say, in fact, the church actively asserts and promotes the intrinsic dignity of every person. As human persons, persons with a homosexual inclination have the same basic rights as all people, including the right to be treated with dignity. The, under, the inner logic of this is that whenever we fail to treat people with dignity, our personal and communal moral outlook is impoverished. 
that we become less than who we fully should be as moral persons. So respect and advocacy for homosexual persons as persons is, is in many ways a necessity for us as church to have a coherent moral point of view. How about the inner logic behind homosexual teaching on homosexual, or on, on homosexual behaviors? Two key terms here. First term is complementarity. The second term is chastity. That church teaching, and, and these two core concepts are backed up by the use of scripture. First term is complementarity. Um, that there's this under, uh, understanding at the core of the church teaching that there's a male-female complementarity. Some of the clearest expressions of this, if you look at John Paul II's lectures on the body. Now, as I said, one way to think about it is that male and female complement one another. They fit together like puzzle pieces. They fit together on the biological level. They fit together on the psychological level. They fit together at the deep existential level. They fit together socially. And that that is what the church sees as part of the natural order of things. Now, the second key concept behind church teaching on homosexual behaviors is a concern for chastity. Now, chastity isn't what we would normally think about it today. When the church talks about chastity, what it's talking about is sexual integrity. And a core definition of chastity from always our children is that chastity means integrating one's thoughts, feelings, and actions in the area of human sexuality in a way that values and respects one's own dignity and that of others. So, and then the, the use of scripture. This is, this is backed up by... Uh, the, complement, the notion of complementarity is, is backed up by the, the creation stories of Adam and Eve from Genesis. We know the two creation stories, the, the first one we find, which is actually the second one written, Genesis 1, 1, 1 to 2, 3, and then the second creation story of Adam and Eve, Genesis 2, 4 to 24. And, and then that's further backed up by scriptural you know, uh, claims about that, that um, homosexual general activity cannot be chaste because it's uh, spoken about in the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, as an abomination. And the, the passages that are often highlighted are the two passages I've noted here from Leviticus, which are the holiness codes in Leviticus, where it actually uses the word abomination. Now, what about church teaching on homosexual relationships? What's interesting about church teaching on homosexual relationships, oh, ba back one, right there, is that there's this attempt to balance the concern for homosexual persons as persons with a concern for um, preserving complementarity, uh, concern for chastity, a concern for preserving the unitive and procreative natures of marriage and the other. So it's a balancing of these two things. And we see this balancing on the, on the no side where the church says no, be, no, no to, to same-sex unions, no to gay marriage, no to adopting children because those disrupt the natural order of things. But it says in all of that, we should respect homosexual persons as persons. And where, we, where balancing comes in is if a same-sex couple comes and presents their child for baptism, at that point, our focus should not be on them as a same-sex couple. Our focus should be them, uh, on them as persons and respect for them as persons. And if as persons, they pre can present themselves as persons of genuine integrity and as persons of genuine faith, and they demonstrate to us that they have the ability to welcome children into a home and raise those children in faith, we should respond to them on the personal level by welcoming them into the community. So there's a delicate balancing act at the pastoral level that we're called to as church and trying to, under, and trying to live out church teaching on homosexuality. Now, what can we talk about as the strengths of church teaching on homosexuality? The, the, hopefully, I've already indicated the strengths to you in what I've already said. That the, the church adopts a holistic view of human sexuality, including addressing issues of homosexuality. And, 
it, it challenges us in all that we do, not to just reduce sexuality to genital sexuality, but to always see ourselves as sexual beings, as sexual persons, and to see our sexuality as integral to who we are and our sexual development as something that affects us at all levels. So I think that that vision of sexuality the church presents is an inspiring vision that we could hold up today. And it's something the church has to offer uh, within, it, within its communities, but also to the world. Um, and the church speaks out really against the, all efforts to trivialize human sexuality. I think there are strengths in church teaching of sexuality that we should hold up. Now, where might we push on that? a little bit. Where might we, we raise some critical questions? The first place that, um, next one. The first place that I think we can raise some critical questions is on the use of scripture. Where the church holds up the Adam and Eve stories and the, and the holiness codes in Leviticus as um, justification for its understanding of complementarity and for its view of homosexuality is disordered. Um, and, and in doing that, the church actually violates its own standards for how it says we should interpret the Bible. It violates what could be called a Catholic approach to biblical interpretation. And that, that approach has been developed over the course of the past 50 years. Its most recent articulation and a very clear articulation is in the, the, the document Interpretation of the Bible in the Church. A clear distinction in there is that we should, we should distinguish between inspiration and revelation. All the Bibles, the inspired word of God, but not everything, not every passage you would take out is revelatory of the nature of God. And it's not revelatory of the nature of God because some passages in the Bible are simply, uh, God always speaks to us in language and we can understand. God spoke to the biblical authors in language they can understand. A lot of what we find in the Bible is uh, uh, you know, passages where we see God relating to people where they are at in their time and place. So a lot of the Bible just tells us uh, what, where people were at and how they viewed the world at the time particular text was written. So we look at the Bible when it says in the creation stories that God put a dome over the world. We aren't to take that literally. We're to read that as, as, well, that's the inspired word of God. That doesn't reveal anything to us about God or about the nature of the world. It's simply, it's a passage about... Um, that how God could, could present the creation stories in a way that people at that time could understand. But where do we violate that? We violate the way we say we should approach Scripture. We violate that, that the, basing our interpretation of Scripture on that core distinction between inspiration and revelation when we cherry-pick passages out, such as when we cherry-pick passages out of Adam and Eve and say, aha, uh -huh, complementarity, aha, uh -huh abomination. If, if, not to say we couldn't use scripture in, in making a case against homosexual, or making case that homosexuality, homosexual behaviors should be prohibited, but we can't do it in the way that current teaching does. That if we just look at the Genesis text, we have a very different understanding today of community. We have a very different understanding of persons. We have a very different understanding of male and female roles. We, 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 they didn't have the distinction at the time either the, the, the creation stories were written. They didn't have the distinction between homosexual persons and homosexual behavior. So when we take all that modern baggage and we read the text as if it's there, we're reading into the text. We're not doing exegesis, we're doing uh, exegesis, we're, we're misinterpreting scripture. So, so really, in the way the church uses scripture in its teaching on homosexuality undermines the approach to scriptural interpretation that the church has been trying to make for the last 50 plus years. So, so we, we, we need to look carefully at that. A second area where we can critique it is in the notion of complementarity. Remember I said at the beginning that the church's understanding of complementarity, the purpose of it, is to foster, to provide guidelines that would foster human growth and development, the full flourishing of persons. I think we can, fairly, we can safely say today that the church's understanding of complementarity is perhaps too rigid. And we don't have to look at homosexuality to see this. We can talk about in terms of male-female 
relatedness. That in, in both in church and society, we see two rigid understandings of, <coughs> of complementarity that limit rather than support human growth and development. An example that, to give you an, uh, to illustrate this, concrete example, I told you I'm the father of twins. Uh, when uh, my twins were six weeks old, uh, my, uh, my wife went back to work. I stayed home. I took care of the boys. I raised my sons at home. I was the one at home. We needed support. We were living in an area without any, any family around. We went to our local church. And they said, for people in situations like yours, we have, a parent, we have a Mothers of Twins Club. So we went to the Mothers of Twins Club, and they said, your wife is welcome to come and join our meetings. My wife didn't need to go to the meetings. I needed to go to the meetings because I was the one at home with the kids. So, so my wife had, she would go to work in the morning, and when the Mothers of Twins Club met, she'd come, she'd come home, she'd go to the meeting, and she'd get all the information and the resources, and then she'd bring them home to me. So there's a case where this, this notion of complementarity as it's developed has become too rigid. So there's lots of calls saying, and talking about complementarity of male and female, we need to be a little less rigid than we were in the past. And so one of, the, one of the critiques of church teaching on homosexuality is when we look at homosexual behaviors, is this understanding of complementarity that's too rigid now even for heterosexuals, is it f even more rigid and, and more creating more hardships for those who are homosexuals? One final point uh, of critique, and this is concerns the notion of chastity. I noted before that the, the church recognizes a distinction between promiscuous homogenal activity in a gay subculture and same-sex couples bringing their child for baptism. And somewhere or another, the church calls us to say, there could be a sexual integrity to a same-sex couple bringing their child for baptism. The problem we have in the church is we don't have a language for talking about that. The distinctions that we're called to make in pastoral practice, church teaching doesn't give us a language for talking about those distinctions and exploring them. So, and it's because the notion of chastity perhaps is too narrow. So we need to have a broader conversation about what it means to be chaste and what it could mean for homosexual persons to live a chaste lifestyle. Concluding comments, as I've said before, I think church teaching on homosexuality needs to be understood more fully. Some people are dismissive of church teaching uh, because they don't understand it. They don't see its richness and complexity. Sometimes in pastoral setting, uh, the, the real respect the church calls us to give towards homosexual persons is not found. And it's because we have people working in the pastoral ministry who don't understand the church teaching. So a core thing that needs to happen as we move forward is church teaching on homosexuality needs to be understood more fully. Um, and I think that the, the appropriate context for discussing it as all issues of sexuality is to focus on full human personhood. <coughs> and I think that continue, respectful dialogue needs to continue. And the scary part is, and, and church teaching tells us this, is that if we have the respectful dialogue we need, we're all going to be changed. We're all going to be challenged. It uses the word, we're going to be challenged to ongoing conversion. But if we're people of faith, can and should we expect anything less? Thank you.